What a wonderful event. It's good to see someone here. My name is Pastor John. I'm a regional president for the Tribe of Judah Motorcycle Ministry. It's an honor for me today to get to uh, introduce the next speaker. He's had a tremendous impact on my life and hundreds and thousands of people around the world today. 30 years ago, he began a motorcycle ministry that is stretched throughout the United States and around the globe. And I'm so thankful that uh, he can be here today and I'm, I'm uh, grateful that I'm able to introduce him. The founder and international president of the Tribe of Judah Motorcycle Ministry, Pastor Ben Priest. Would you welcome him this morning? Thank you, brother. God bless you. How's everybody doing today? If you're doing really good, say, I'm doing really, really good. It's good to be here with you in Enid, Oklahoma. I'm from Texas right now, currently been there for a long time. And I thank God for the state of Texas. I thank God for the, uh, the state of Oklahoma and people that have a mindset for the things of God, for people that, that, that are, are not intimidated by things that are going on in the White House and different political arenas that are standing for truth and things that they really believe in. And my hat's off to you. My heart's with you, and I know some of the storms and things that's come through the area. Uh, here recently, there, there's a lot of people praying and believing God for restoration and wholeness concerning those things. I don't believe I could have said it any better than what Kevin said it a few minutes ago, that God loves you and God cares about you, and I want to encourage you along those lines. Uh, every one of us, God's designed something special for our lives. And a lot of times people are scared of God because they don't understand Him. And I was reading a verse in the, in the book of Proverbs here just recently, and I thought about it today. It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And uh, the mindset in America right now has pushed God out of the way, has pushed God out of the schools, out of the classrooms, out of government, out of everything around. And it's beginning to cause a lot of problems because man begins to think he can deal with himself and do what he needs to do and want to do. And God wants to be in the middle of everything going on in our lives. The reason I know this to be true is my family was destroyed when I was just a little bitty kid, five years old, and uh, every dream that I had up to that time was gone, and I watched my family be dissipated, and uh, family members of mine were murdered, and all kind of terrible things were going on, and uh, I felt like I had an identity crisis in my life, and I know so many people today struggle with a thing called an identity crisis, and they're trying to put their identity in sports figures and Hollywood and all kind of things, and God is intended for every man and every woman, every boy, every girl to put their identity in Him and to find their security and to find their hope in Him because He loves us and He cares about us. Well, I, I went along through things and was promised a scholarship at LSU playing football, and I thought, well, that will go well for me. And then race wars broke out between blacks and whites where I was living in Louisiana where I grew up at the time. And I ended up getting a lot, in a lot of trouble. And uh, there was a man that was an outlaw that, that, that took notice in me in a violent act that I'd gotten myself involved in. And uh, he said, I like the way you handled yourself today. He said, I'm going to train you and teach you how to be a man where you can live the way that you want to live and do what you want to do and live your own life. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world that I'd never have to answer to anybody again. And the bottom line of what that thing did, it destroyed my future and what I wanted to do, play in sports and, and uh, having a possibility of going to college and an education and all those things. And I ended up living in a, in a cell in Louisiana looking at spending the rest of my natural life in Angola in the Louisiana State Penitentiary and had a terrible drug habit and a lot of things that were going way wrong in my life. And uh, so I didn't know what was going on. They blew that on a technicality and had to let me and five other people go in that situation. And when I got out of there, I went to Texas and said, I'll never go back home again to Louisiana. I was scared. And I found out that, that fear is a terrible thing and people face that and have strongholds of fear in their life a lot of times. You know, in this Bushido uh, conference today, you know, they're talking about, uh, you know, every man's going to have to define his struggle and uh, claim his victory. And every one of us do have a victory in God. But the greatest thing we need to realize is that there is a real enemy of our soul. There is a, a destroyer that's trying to take out the men in America and around the world, that's trying to destroy the family values and destroy marriage. And then you've got generations of, of kids that are coming up 
with no direction, no guidance, and, and nothing to hang their hat on it or put their heart into. And that's not the will of God for this nation or for anybody's life that's here. This nation was founded upon the Word of God. It was founded upon righteousness and upon right things that go on. I found out that, our, that good is not always right, but right is always good. God is always right and righteous about things, and the outcome of what He does is always good. Sunday, May the 11th, 1980, uh, somebody called me at the house I was in on the north side of Houston, and I was sitting there in, in the middle of a deliberate drug overdose. I didn't want to live the life I'd been involved in anymore. I didn't want to see anybody else's life become destroyed, especially at the hand of what I was doing. And the telephone rang. I picked it up, and there was a girl on the other end of the phone I'd never heard of and didn't know who it was. And they said, are you Ben? And I said, yeah, I am. And uh, they, said, they said, my name's Gloria. And they were from Mississippi, and, and they were dating my brother. And my brother had given his heart to Jesus three years before this happened. And I, th I thought, you know, he had lost his mind and didn't really know what was going on with him. And, uh, but it was, it was for real in his life. And uh, she said, I just wanted to call you today and tell you that you need to go to church today. And I said, man, I don't know where to go to church. I said, you know, church is for good people. The church ain't for people like me. And uh, she said, no, there's a church there in Houston called Lakewood Church, and you need to go to it. And she gave me directions to it. So I walked into church that morning at Lakewood Church at 7500 East Houston Road, and John Osteen was a pastor at the time. Joel Osteen's my pastor now and has been since uh, his, his dad passed away. But I walked through the doors that day, and I had real long hair and long whiskers. I was full of dope, full of the devil. I was mean, and I was an extremely violent human being. It was out of control. And when I walked through the doors of the church, there were people standing around with all these goofy, you know, goofy grins on their face, and they were loving each other and happy and all this stuff. And I thought, man, you got to be kidding. This is, this is like an insane asylum break right here. And uh, so I came through the doors, and this guy caught me by the arm. And he said, hello, brother. It's good to see you here at church this morning. And I said, I'm not your brother. Get your hands off me. And he said, come on, I'll find you a seat and you can sit down. Well, there was standing room only that day. It was Mother's Day. And uh, there was people standing, thousands of people in this place. And he took me right up on the front row you know, where the prayer, prayer partners were. And I'm sitting there just all messed up, full of dope and full of just crazy things. And Pastor Osteen came out and began to talk about Jesus and said, if you'll just give your life to Jesus, he can change everything in your life, every miracle, every dream, everything that you have need of in your life, you're going to find it in the Lord Jesus. And I'm thinking the whole time, this sounds really good, but it sounds too good to be true. But God couldn't do that for somebody like me that's done the kind of things that I've done and been involved in the kind of junk I've been involved in. And uh, so anyway, he gave an altar call, and I walked away from there. And I felt so alone and so empty when I did. And God had been dealing with my heart. There's people that are right here in this Coliseum today. God loves you, and, and somebody's been praying for you, and somebody cares about you greatly. Some of you might have a relationship with Jesus, and some of you might not. And uh, they said the same thing that night. Just come and give your heart to Jesus. He can change and fix what you can't do. And I uh, walked out of there, and I thought, man, you know, I can't leave this place without knowing the truth. And I stopped outside of that church right out in the shells on the side of the road there, and I knelt down. And I said, Jesus, I don't know where you are, but if you're real like these people have been saying, I'll give my life to you right now. I called God to a square to prove himself to me that day, and I meant every bit of it. And uh, when I did, he touched my life and changed my life. He saved me, filled me with the Holy Ghost. He healed me from a 10-year drug habit. I've been drug and alcohol free and violent free for 33 years, praise God. And uh, the first thing that I did is I uh, realized that my mind changed. It's like I woke up out of a bad dream and God began to fill me with his love. First thing I did is uh, when I walked away from that situation right there, I knew that I was changed and I was different. And I offered my hands to God. I said, Lord, I'm going to give my hands to you tonight. And I promise you I'll never touch another human being with them in violence. The only thing that will ever come out of my hands again is to heal people and to love people and to encourage people because you filled my life with your love, and that is undeniable. And uh, in the midst of all these things that was going on, I started praying and asking God to help me to find family members that were still alive and stuff like that. 
And over the course of about two years, God helped me find every one of my family members that, had, uh, that were still alive, that weren't murdered, dead, or whatever the case may be. And God started healing all those relationships right there and stuff like that. The thing that my baby brother told me is he used to call me up and read the Bible to me. And how many of you know that the Word of God is powerful? I'm telling you, the Word of God never changes. Everything in the administration in the White House and everywhere else might change, but God's Word is always true and it'll never change. And that's what we need to put our thoughts and our mind and our heart in is what God says because God's not a liar. So many people in America and around the world are living in lies right now and living in deception. And I know that people are tired of it because I'm a person and I got real tired of it. I wanted something real and I wanted something true and something that I could hang my heart on and keep it there. But this is what my baby brother told me. He, he, pick, he would uh, call me. He would read the Bible to me over the phone. And I was high on drugs. I said, man, I don't want to hear all that mess. And uh, and then finally he stopped doing it after several months. And the last thing he said to me, he said, Ben, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, he said, I'm through calling you. I'm not wasting any more phone calls. I'm not spending any more money on these phone calls to tell you nothing. He said, I found a father that would never leave me. And when he said that, my heart exploded on the inside. And I knew that I had to find out about this God that, that would love me and never leave me. Well, I'm here today to tell you that, that God has given me a new life. And I didn't know how to sing or dance or play a musical instrument. I could probably break bricks and heads and all that kind of stuff. Done a lot of crazy things before. But I said, Lord, I don't have any place to fit in the church world. Have you ever been there before? Happened to me. And I said, the only thing I know anything about life is uh, street life and motorcycles. How does that fit in the kingdom of God? And uh, so God put another motorcycle in my life. It was a 1950 Panhead. And uh, people were saying, if you get on that thing, you're going to end up going to hell. That thing's evil, wicked, and nasty, and mean, and all that. And I said, no, man, that's the way I was, and God changed all that in my life. And uh, so I went and picked that motorcycle up and uh, got back on it and took off. And so for the past you know, over 30 years now, I've been in the highways and the hedges and going around the world telling people about the love of God. But our primarily what we do in our ministry is to minister to one percenters, to the outlaw community, the Hells Angels, the Banditos, the Mongols, the outlaws, all those people all over the world. And uh, even when they didn't understand it, they realize now that God sent us to them because God loves everybody. And uh, so in that situation, uh, I asked God for a wife. And the Bible says that he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. And I wanted some of that. The reason being because I didn't want to fall back in sin because God had delivered me from so much. And, uh, and I said, Lord, I, I need to find a wife. And I, I was out behind my house one night scratching bark off pine trees and ho howling at the moon, you know, because I didn't want to live, you know, the way I wasn't supposed to. But I said, Lord, I can't take this anymore. I, I want a woman in my life. And God said, you need more than a woman. You need a wife. And I said, all right, I need a wife. Help me find one. And I found a wife, and uh, God put us together. We've been married almost 30 years now. And listen to me, and I'm talking to the men right now. If you're a man, say, I'm a man. Come on, if you're a man, show it up. Say, I'm a man. There you go. If you're a man, listen to me right now. Uh, all this uh, macho stuff and all that, that's, that's all fine and dandy. But the greatest uh, act of machismo or whatever you want to call it I've ever seen is when there was an innocent man that walked up to Calvary beaten half to death, naked in front of the whole world and was nailed to a cross. That, to me, is a man's life. And he did it for me and for you and for every other person that will ever touch the face of this earth right here because he loved them. He took all the guilt, all the shame, all the sin for each and every one of us. That's real. And I, I, how in the world could somebody say no to somebody that's done something like that for each and every one of us? What I had to do is I had to, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I said, Lord, you're going to have to teach me how to be a husband because I don't know how to be one. Before I had this wife in my life, a woman wasn't nothing but a piece of property, and if I wanted a carton of cigarettes or a headlight or whatever, I'd trade her for it. It didn't make any difference because you could just find another one somewhere. But God said that's a wrong mindset. So I had to learn. Everybody say I'm learning right now. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say I'm learning something right now. Yeah, tell your neighbor, you need to hear this. <laughs> yeah, I had to learn to become a man God's way and to be a husband 
God's way, which was a huge learning curve for me. And then my wife started telling me she wanted babies. Babies are good, all right? Everybody say, babies are good. Yeah, I guarantee you, because you used to be one. Yeah, check it out. Let's break it on down. And uh, so I said, and my wife was saying, let's have some children. And I said, I don't want any children. I don't, you know, life is great till you add people into the equation. Can I get a witness? Huh? Yeah, now you start adding little bitty people in the equation, and it really gets rough sometimes. And so anyway, I, I'm sitting there thinking about all this. So we're married six years, and she said, I want children. And I said, well, I don't. And she said, well, I've been praying and asking God for children. And I said, I've been praying and asking God for no children. And she said, finally, and my wife's a, a small lady. She's 118 pounds, and her name's Tammy. We call her Tambo now because she's a radical revolutionary for God. She pulled her bony finger out and stuck it in my chest, and she said, hey, hey, buddy, let me tell you something. God's word is true, and God did not give you fear, the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And she said, uh, you need to deal with this right now. So I, I owned it, and I said, yep, I'm fearful of having kids because I don't know what to do with them, and I don't want to screw their lives up like my life got screwed up. And uh, we prayed, and uh, she got pregnant right away. It was great. It was wonderful. I liked it all. It was, it was cool. And, uh, and, and my baby was fixing to be born. Can I take just a minute and tell you about my first baby? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I was thinking it was going to be a little boy, and come to find out it was a little girl. All right? And I had about 35 of my brothers that rode with me out in the waiting room, and we all had real long hair and whiskers. And we all loved Jesus, but, man, we were scary looking. And uh, they said, going on out there? It looks like a jailbreak or something. And they said, oh, no, one of them's having my baby, but they're going to be all right. You know, they love Jesus. You know, they're, they're calm and they're peaceful. And they said, thank God. So anyway, I'm in the, in, the, in the operating room there, or the delivery room, and I got this little cap and gown on, and the doctor's sweating and heaving and hoeing and doing all that stuff. And I'm thinking, man, you need to sweat much as you're charging me for all this. And he was working. But anyway, he began to, to pull this little baby out into the world. And uh, when he did, I said, yeah, that's a big boy, Doc. And he said, nope. He said, this is a big girl. And this was on video. It was tastefully done. And I said, man, you got to be kidding. I said, is there another one in there? And he said, no, this is it right here. And handed me that little baby. And I didn't know what to do. This is the first time I'd ever touched a kid in my life. And she's brand new. And it's a girl, which just freaked me out. What am I going to do with a girl now? And, um, you know, and so I looked at her. And, and, and she's all sticky and gooey and everything. And, and I looked down at her and I said, hello. I said, I'm your daddy and I love you and I'll be here forever. I promise you I will never leave you. I told her right there in my hands. And I stuck my finger out. I said, it's for you if you want it. And do you know that little bitty, just 30 second old kid peeled open one eye and looked right out at me? Look right in my heart, man, and reached up and grabbed my finger. And I just, oh, I fell so in love with her, man. And I said, oh, you're mine, you're mine, you're all mine. And uh, my wife said, let me see her. I said, no, get your own. This is mine right here. You know, no way. But anyway, God began to teach me how to be a daddy. And you men, if you'll ask God to help you change your mindset about things, and don't try to raise your children or train or teach your children the way the world is, Train them up in the way the Word of God says, and you'll always do right by it. And God blessed me with a son 13 months later, and uh, they're both, you know, in 20, 21, fixed turn 22 now, and got great lives. They're beautiful kids and all that, and they work with me in ministry. And uh, God's been so good to me, and God's been so faithful to me. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm closer to 100 now than I am the other way, and my grandmother's 101 years old. And she told me when I was four years old over a can of pat, uh, a pan of cathead biscuits, she, son, she said, son, my name's Etta Hill. I'm just like God. I change not. She said, when I'm 100 years old, you're going to remember these words. She said, you understand me? I said, yes, ma'am. And I spent her 100th and her 101st birthday with me. She's still sharp as a tack. And I turned a little video camera on in my pocket. You know, I got a little thing on cell phone. I said, Etta. I call her Etta. I don't call her grandma. Her name's Etta. I said, Etta. It's your birthday today. You want to say something to the camera? She said, my name's Etta Hill. She said, I'm 100 year old today. I'm just like God, and I change not. And I thought, you know, she's lived to prove that God's faithfulness will always be there. And I want to encourage each and every one of you, whatever God's told you or promised you in your life, you can do it. 
no matter what's gone on in the past, just leave it today. When you walk out of this place today, if you've had failures, mistakes, if you've been part of the human race, leave that part of it here. They'll sweep it up and haul it off somewhere. But walk out of this place with a new life. Walk out of here with new direction and a new heart and let the love of God change what needs to be changed in your life. I found out something that love never fails because God is love and God cannot fail. So I want to encourage you today, if you know the Lord, continue on with him and walk well with him. If you've known him and you've fallen away or you're just kind of off course, get your thought life straightened out and get back on course with him. If you don't know him, you can. It's as simple as just calling out to him. It's not a matter of joining religion. It's not a matter of joining a church. It's a matter of saying yes to Jesus and no to all the mess that goes on in the world and all the heartache and misery that it brings. I'm going to ask you today right here in front of God and everybody, if you're today, here today within the sound of my voice, you're looking at me, I'm looking at you, and you'd be willing to say, you know, I need to make some changes in my life today. If you're a man and you need to make changes, just be honest about it. If you're a woman here and you've got problem in your marriage, how many of you know that marriage is work? It really is, you know, and, and if you work at it God's way, it'll be blessed and you can do well with it. And uh, if you're parents, God can straighten things out with your children. Or maybe you're a young person here today, but the bottom line before I leave, my reasonable service is what I do is to ask people to bring them to a point to where they've got to make a decision. You got to make a decision today. And don't say, well, you know, I'll do it later. You already made your decision when you did that. I'm just going to ask you, would you say yes to Jesus or would you say no to him? And uh, I'm going to ask you, if you would say yes to Jesus today, that you would just slip your hand up and say, I would say yes to Jesus. I know that he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life. Amen. Just hold it up there and wave it at me for just a minute. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray a prayer for you right now. And they've got people over here, on both, I think just standing around here, pastors and other people, that can pray for you if you need it or if you need some help. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be happy to stay here and help you if we can to pray with you. How many of you know that, that prayer can change anything? Amen. Faith in God will move anything in the direction it's supposed to go. And so I'm, what I'm going to do right now, I'm just going to pray a, a prayer over everybody that's here at this event. And if you raised your hand, just then, and, and if you don't, don't have peace in your heart with God, just accept this with him. And uh, if you wanted to slip your hand up and you're thinking, well, I don't know about all that, you know, what will other people think? Who cares what other people think? Who cares what anybody else thinks? When we got to stand before God one day, amen, and give an account for our life. Our lives are covered. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus. We've been healed by stripes. God healed both my kidneys and my liver, man. And I, I ain't on any kind of meds or nothing, hadn't been all my life. God healed him, and he's kept me healed and kept me strong all these years. And I'm going to stay that way because he loves me, and I understand that, and he loves you too. So I'm going to pray a prayer right quick for you. All you got to do is just accept it in your heart. Just say yes. That's all you got to do, and God will do what he needs to do. Father, I ask you right now in the name of Jesus that each and every one of these precious people that are here today, men, women, boys, and girls, families or whatever they might be that are here represented, Lord, that those that their hearts are turned towards you and things I'm asking as I stand on this platform, that the Spirit of God would move in their life and help them do what needs to be done. And as they made decisions to move towards you, that you would honor those things and help them in their life with you. And Father, for other people that might not know what to do in their life right now, that you make yourself real to them and let them know that the love of God will never fail them and that you will never leave them, you will never forsake them. I'm asking you this in Jesus' name. And Father, I'm asking for the blessing of God to rest upon Enid, Oklahoma. And Lord, that you would turn this great nation, the United States of America, back to the things of God and that people would stand up and be the men and women that you've called them to be. We honor you and bless you for these things right now. God bless you. Everybody say, God's not mad at me. He loves me. Yeah, well, now what did I tell you today? God's not mad at you. He loves you. Everybody say, God's not mad at me. He loves me. He really does. I love you too. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to break the bread of life with you for a few moments to tell you that God loves you. I love you as well. My name is Ben Priest, and I approve of this message. God bless you. <laughs>